just spoke with the king of Saudi Arabia, who denies any knowledge of what took place. Give me a word or phrase to describe Ted Cruz. Divisive. Constitutional. Douchebag. They eat a tremendous amount. Some people have called them the perfect invader. Viktor Orban's right-wing government has made it illegal for homeless people in Hungary to sleep in public. The law, which went into effect today, forces the homeless into shelters and lets police detain them and destroy their possessions if they're caught sleeping outside three times in 90 days. Hungary's government says it's spending a million dollars to expand state-run shelters, where there are reported to be about half as many beds available as there are people sleeping on the street. Sears, the company that changed American shopping with its mail order catalog, has filed for bankruptcy. The 132-year-old store has been losing money since 2011 and is more than $5 billion in debt. Sears says it'll close 142 of its worst performing stores by the end of the year, but hasn't said what will happen to its 68,000 employees. Beer will soon be more difficult to produce and more expensive to buy, thanks to the effects of global warming. Scientists found extreme heat and drought will impact the growth of barley, a key ingredient used to make beer, by as much as 17%. The Trump administration announced plans to force drug companies to show their prices in television ads, hours after America's biggest drug lobbying group, Pharma, announced its solution, directing viewers to drug costs online. Health Secretary Alex Azar says that isn't enough. But placing information on a website is not the same as putting it right in an ad. And it's taken them five months since the president's blueprint to start skating to where the puck is going. The government of Saudi Arabia is preparing to admit that its security agents killed journalist and dissident Jamal Khashoggi, according to reports from CNN and The Wall Street Journal. That's a stunning admission of a brazen and anti-democratic crime. It's also really awkwardly timed, because just this morning, President Trump seemed to be going out of his way to give the Saudi Arabian government an out. The king firmly denied any knowledge of it. He didn't really know, maybe, I, I don't want to get into his mind, but it sounded to me like maybe these could have been rogue killers, who knows? Whether the president changes his tune or not, there are some limited ways Congress can put pressure on the administration to punish Saudi Arabia. Last week, a bunch of senators invoked what's called the Global Magnitsky Act. That law was originally aimed at Vladimir Putin's Russia, but it can be used to sanction any and all human rights offenders, freeze their assets, and ban them from entering the United States. It also makes the president initiate an investigation into what happened. Another option, Congress could pass a resolution to disapprove the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. But even if Congress actually had enough votes to do that, the president could just veto it. Adam Smith, who used to work on sanctions in Obama's Treasury Department, told me that in reality, this all pretty much comes down to what the president wants to do. It still is the case that when it comes to sanctions, even quote unquote mandatory sanctions like the kind you might have in place now with respect to Russia, um, and that the kind that theoretically you could sort of force the president's hand on with respect to Magnitsky. At the end of the day, it's still a discretionary tool. And so much of sort of the congressional power in this regard is structured in the same manner, that you've got sort of requirements for the executive to do certain things. They hinder the president's quick activities in some cases, but very rarely uh, with respect to foreign policy, national security issues, does Congress have the final say? So assuming the final say comes from the Oval Office, it might be instructive to look at how the president has dealt with authoritarian leaders since taking the oath. For instance, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, or Egypt's Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, or North Korea's Kim Jong-un. It's been something close to an international bromance. He wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. We fell in love. And of course, there's our commander-in-chief's relationship with the strongest of the world's strongmen, Vladimir Putin. Do you agree that Vladimir Putin is involved in assassinations, in poisonings? Probably he is, yeah, probably. I mean, I don't probably, do probably but I rely on them. It's not in our country. Okay. The situation in Saudi Arabia is just as complicated as our relationship with Russia, and maybe more so. The administration has close ties to Saudi rulers, Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and advisor, has a back channel to Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Trump's first overseas trip as president included a two-day stop in Saudi Arabia, where he was greeted in lavish style. And there are good old-fashioned geopolitics at play. 
even beyond arms sales to the Saudis that could total $110 billion. So you definitely have Saudi Arabia still a major player in the oil markets, despite the fact that the U.S. now produces a lot on itself. They are significant players with respect to hemming in Iran, which is a huge player, obviously, in foreign policy from a U.S. perspective. And of course, the reason they're in Yemen is it's part of the the Iran strategy, because the Houthis there are apparently allied with or getting support from the Iranians. So it's sort of very much sort of interlaced in a way. So it's complicated. And the signals we're sending are complicated, too. On the one hand, the president has dispatched the Secretary of State to Riyadh to discuss Khashoggi. But for now, he isn't stopping another cabinet member, Secretary Steve Mnuchin, from attending an opulent investment conference in Saudi Arabia later this month that some prominent American CEOs have dropped out of. A move that kind of says to the wider world, yeah, the U.S. government is banking on business as usual. Congressman Beto O'Rourke, who's challenging Senator Ted Cruz in Texas, announced that his campaign raised more than $38 million in the third quarter of this year, the most ever raised by a Senate candidate in a single quarter. The race between O'Rourke and Cruz is one of the most heated in the country. But like so much else in American politics right now, it's not really about the candidates themselves. Increasingly, it's about the guy at the very top. Give me a word or phrase to describe Ted Cruz. Divisive. Constitutional. Arrogant. Committed. Douchebag. Principled. Unproductive. Unlikable. Steadfast. Smarmy. Competent. Hypocrite. Slimy. Christian. (laughs) Okay, I need a word or phrase to describe Beto O'Rourke. Abortion. Likeable. Smarmy. Bad on immigration. Definitely not smarmy. Liar. That's a call to action. Socialist. Compassionate. Fraud. Hope. Left. Different. Anti-Second Amendment. Equality. What is it about Ted Cruz you don't like? I think Ted Cruz has sold his soul. If someone talked about my husband the way that Trump talked about his wife, to me, that is way more important than politics. It's way more important than anything else. Because they're one so, of the, the, they're on the same team now. There's cohesiveness within the party. No, now. he wants to be reelected. There is no cohesiveness. Well, there's truth here. to that as well. But that's the he impetus the for presidents being presidents and advocating Senator for people. Ever. Do you like Ted Cruz? I actually do. I I supported him in the in the primaries over Trump. I have fundamental issues with Cruz because we're creating trillion dollar, over trillion dollar deficits, but now it's okay. Beto O'Rourke and Ted Cruz, they may raise more money than any campaign in the history of America. Why is this so important? Why is so much money flowing into this state? I think the Democrats are trying to prove to the country that they can turn a bright red state blue. All that Ted Cruz has done is tried to repeat appeal health care 40 something times and failed each time. And by run the for way. president. And then That's he, all he does. And ran for president. And then and then he missed half of the votes while he's been there. And what has he done? What major piece of legislation has he ever done? I so I'm a Beto voter. I will be. And the reason for that is is because of the polarization right now. I don't agree with all of his policies. Absolutely don't. But I don't, I I disagree with all all of Cruz's policies. I disagree with the wall, I disagree with all of that. And I guarantee you as a mother of two boys that I would do everything illegal, legal, it doesn't matter what it is to get my children into this country. Is there a problem with that? Yes. 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 You would let somebody rape your child. Sovereign countries that have laws. Obey those laws. You go to other countries, you can't just walk in and do anything you want in their country. What is the immigration problem? We got about 12 million undocumented illegal aliens in this country. Do you see a problem with using the words illegal aliens? No. You're no. calling it what it is. Isn't it's that illegal. the term that we're supposed to use? That's, that was acceptable. Undocumented workers is not a real term. Illegal alien is what's in the government regulations. That's the term they used to describe them. Why do we demonize the people that get lured here by business owners 
that have jobs waiting for them? Why don't we do mandatory prison time for anybody that hires an illegal alien? Fine. Fine. Mandatory federal We're okay time. With that. Or at least do fine. fine. Yeah. With it. Stop Big luring fine. them here, and then you demonize fine. the people. Uh, this, this is, about is America. You come in but here. This is about you come humans. in here legally. My parents and my grandparents were immigrants. They worked hard. They adopted and they came into this country legally. Voting based on emotion, you got to base it on facts. What are the facts? America is like a lifeboat. And at a certain point, if you bring everybody into the lifeboat, the lifeboat sinks. We have American children that are starving. Yeah. How many kids do you know that go to school every day and then they also bring a backpack home on the weekend where the churches have provided food for our American children. By a show of hands, who wants to build a wall? Raise your hands. Who is opposed to a wall? Raise your hands. Just like America, split 50-50. Why not a wall? All of the people who voted to build the wall and the people who want illegal immigrants deported are the same people who want lower taxes, but tax money is exactly where that budget to build the wall is gonna come from. Here's how you pay for the wall. 12 million illegal immigrants. You put them on a modified path to citizenship, a new visa, and every year you have to pay $1,000 to maintain that visa, okay? If you have 12 million people paying $1,000 for the next, 20, next 10 years, that's $120 billion that you just generated. What's wrong with that? Well, because they're making eight, $10 an hour and they're barely feeding their children. Undocumented worker should pay $1,000 a year because they are here. I don't know about 1000 but a path is a path. I, I agree that there should be some sort of path. There's no way you're going to get rid of 12 million people that are sitting here contributing to our society, helping us grow, making us more diverse, all things that we want. Should there be a path to citizenship? I'm Hispanic and I don't think so. so and two. I'll but tell you why, because there should be a consequence to them entering Illegal, True. True. so there should not be a path to citizenship. Absolutely. Maybe consider uh, giving them status to stay here legally, but not impact the platform for either Democrat or Republican. You are taking a position that is different from a majority of your community. Back in the day, even if you weren't, maybe in the 70s, 80s, if you were illegal and you got deported, you grabbed your family and went home. I love my family, I still have family in Mexico. So, and I've seen it growing up here in Texas. Were you born here? Friends. I was born here in Dallas. What about your parents? My parents were born in Mexico. Did they come here legally? Uh, actually, that's a good question. I haven't asked them. Uh, you had $10,000 on the line. Did both your parents come here legally? Thinking about it, probably not. And I would still stick to my views because I was born in this great country that believes in the rule of law and they come from a country that even though they have laws on the book, which is Mexico, they almost are not followed through. Who's gonna win this race? Ted Cruz. Who thinks Ted Cruz, raise your hands. And he th who thinks Beto O'Rourke? So where are my Beto voters who think that Cruz is gonna win? Explain why. That's a red state, we're conservative. Beto is the, the challenge. And unfortunately, Texas is a you know, doesn't really do a lot of change. And just like me, you know, before the Kavanaugh thing, I probably wasn't going to vote, but this Kavanaugh thing is going to turn out a lot of people. What is it about what happened that is now making you a voter? I think he was treated very unfairly. But why would that cause you to vote? Because I think they, done, they did him totally wrong. Flipkart was a two-man startup selling books. Today, it's owned by Walmart, and more than 8,000 employees at their headquarters have been prepping for the busiest time of the year. 
a five-day sale ahead of the holiday Diwali, called Big Billion Days. The responsibility uh, falls on Flipkart to change the shopping habits in India. This year, a very big uh, new philosophy being introduced is let Indians shop even with a minimal budget. So people who could not afford smart televisions before, people who could not afford appliances before, uh, how do you bring them into the shopping funnel is something which we have done in a big way this festival season. Flipkart's event and the Amazon equivalent mirror holiday shopping bonanzas like Cyber Monday in the US and Singles Day in China. The rivals are fighting to become the go-to site for tens of millions of Indians joining the middle class and trying out online shopping for the first time. It's a market worth $25 billion a year. The biggest challenge for, for us is how do you make sure re repeatability comes in, frequency of purchase comes in, velocity comes in. There used to be a lot of uh, fun in shopping with the family. We are trying our best to make sure that the fun doesn't go away. In fact, a lot more fun comes in. When Flipkart launched, only 4% of the country was online. Today, 38% is. In that same period, India's average income more than doubled. And Indians are spending online. The e-commerce market is 12 times what it was six years ago. And it's expected to reach $2 trillion by 2034, when the Indian market is set to overtake e-commerce in America. This year's hot ticket items are mobile phones and kitchen appliances. When the washing machine is a fully automatic machine, huh? The Ranganath family started buying online in 2012. Because now she quite the little bit like a pamajat hogi, bucket, or a do like a little family togetherness. If I got a game because of Munchen or Marcuni, the other stay with Daga, it's like you know, Avang is not good. They want us so half the things I buy is because of saying I have like some still three pairs of unused slippers. <laughs> As the Ranganaths celebrate holidays with a mix of old practices and new traditions, Flipkart's CEO is planning ahead. We have been working on this for almost uh, 10 months. In fact, right after the last festival season, we start working on the next festival season. you to be bold and fearless. The belief in audacious idea compelled us to start Microsoft. I hope you will keep in mind that if you're ever accused of being overly invested in your ideas, it may very well be a sign that you're on the right track. Lionfish are beautiful, deadly bullies. And they've been eating their way across Florida's reefs. Now, fishing competitions, sponsored by conservation groups, are trying to slow them down. You coming down with me? Emily Pepperman has competed in 10 derbies this year. And how many lionfish do you think you've gotten over that stretch? It's hard to tell. Maybe 300 or 400 or so. Derby teams went up to $1,000 for bagging the biggest, the smallest, and the most lionfish. Lionfish don't swim in schools and tend to hide among coral. So the most effective way to kill them is by spearfishing, which is pretty labor intensive. And then when you do see one, how does it work with this spear? Well, I try not to get too excited, <laughs> and I just try to breathe and calm myself and um, just pull back the pole spear, aim as good as you can, and, and try to hit it. What's your goal for this derby? I mean, who doesn't want to win? <laughs> Emily is a seasoned veteran, but newcomers also showed up. Welcome back. How's your dive? Good. Will Wardlaw got the $120 per team entry fee for his 12th birthday. What made you want to do the derby? 
Well, because yeah. there's lionfish and they're destroying the reef, so I wanted to kill them and hopefully save some populations of yeah, smaller fish. Lionfish first showed up in this part of the world in 1985, but it was a really isolated sighting. One here, a few years later, one over there. Lad Aikens is an expert on lionfish and other invasive species. He studied how the fish got from the Indo-Pacific to the shelves of 1980s pet shops. People keep them in their aquariums, but in the aquariums, they eat a lot. They grow very quickly. Sometimes they eat all the other expensive fish, and people have dumped their fish into the ocean. And then in about 2000, 2001, we started to see increases in lionfish populations moving up the east coast of the U.S. By 2005, they'd made it as far as Rhode Island. Some people have called them the perfect invader, and they almost are. An average-sized lionfish, maybe just a little bigger than this, might produce, say, 30,000 eggs every one to four days. They grow very quickly, so they can reach sexual maturity in less than a year. They eat a tremendous amount, and our native marine life don't see them as a threat. Uh, they're protected by venomous spines, so nothing really wants to eat them. And you mentioned before that there is something that makes them vulnerable, the lionfish. What is that? They taste so good. Welcome to John Pettikamp Coral Reef Park and the Lionfish Derby. After each team's kills are tallied up, chefs compete to cook what divers bring in. 1,100 fish this derby. The goal is to get more lionfish into grocery stores and onto menus in the hopes that creating demand for the fish will help deplete their numbers. Most of this day's catch went to Whole Foods. This mixed nut lionfish. So it's encrusted with macadamia, pistachios, and also cashews. Oh yeah, it's good. <laughs> Experts don't know for sure how many lionfish are out there. But they do know it's not possible to eliminate them, even with daily derbies. Recreational divers can only reach depths of 130 feet. Submarines have spotted lionfish at 1,000. You guys caught more than 1,000 today, I know, but then a single fish is over three days producing 50,000 eggs. So how can you tell that it's working? There's studies that have shown that before and after the derby, you see a marked decrease in lionfish populations. Uh, on that site, but then we hope that they continue to go out and catch them. So it's not this one single day event. It's not those thousand fish, it's then the other thousand that, that one team goes out and catches throughout the year because they've kind of been stimulated and excited about it. Since they started in 2009, the derbies have taken 23,000 lionfish off local reefs. Our second place goes to Will to Spear with 34 lionfish. I got second place for first timers. We got second place largest. We had several big fish, but there was a lot of good competition and uh, we still had fun and still got 60 some lionfish off the reef. We all win in the end. <laughs> 